I wonder sometimes how he died. My great, great grandfather. In fact, my great grandfather. I wonder sometimes how he died. I know he was around 25 years old. He was working on the Franklin Square house, a carpenter, Franklin Square house right here in the South End. And I know that he fell off a ladder from the roof. It's quite a large and high building. But I wonder, was it instant? Did he suffer? Who was he with? How did they feel? What were his last thoughts? Were they scared? Was he scared? I think about those things. And I think about the fragility of life and the miracle of it all. Jacob Mark, my great-grandfather who fell from that roof and that ladder, however it happened, was with my great-grandmother and they had just recently become pregnant with my grandfather maybe a month or so before. So my very standing here is once again, a reflection of the precariousness that life holds for us. The variabilities, the variables, the unknowns, that's all wrapped up in it all. And I feel the texts that we engage with on Ash Wednesday speak of that. They speak of a wanting to live even in the face of all these uncertainties. Often Lent is a time where people fast, where they hold back from certain things. Fasting is, of course, in our tradition. It's in a lot of religious traditions, and some, some parts of Christianity practice it a lot more than others. But it's a withholding. It's a letting go of certain things in order to draw closer to the things that are maybe more important, even more important than bread and water or coffee or wine is the closeness to God, is the love of God, is reminding ourselves that you are loved of God. And over the past few years, especially Protestants have, have lifted up this idea of, well, Lent is also about adding things, taking on new practices and new, new ways of recognizing that closeness to God and your belovedness with God. So adding things like stretching or reading scripture or taking some time in silence each day or going for walks or giving of alms, which is this wonderful term of serving those who are in need, including ourselves. These are all wonderful ways of understanding what fasting is all about, giving things up or adding things. And I pray that whatever choices you make as a Lenten journeyer, that those choices are blessed. I also hear in these scriptures a fasting from power over others. It is there. The Jubilee text is so much there, right? We heard it in the painting. Thank you, a sanctified art, right? What kind of fast do I want, says God? A religious exercise? Is that what I want? No, I want to be about Jubilee. I want you to be about Jubilee. I want you to be about the release of captives, of the recovery of vision for all. I want you to, to set people free. I want you to be liberated as, as well. So I wonder, friends, if we might think about this Lent as a time to get curious about our tradition, about our texts, about what it means to be Church of the Covenant in community, learning about each other's deep needs, deep fears, deep, deep hopes, to ask questions of one another. What has been your experience? Tiago, what is it like reading those scriptures for you tonight? Reverend Kate, what is it like for you? What, what is it like for you to light that light tonight? Tom, what is it like for you to play that organ? These kind of questions, what is it like for you to be the student in this world down the street? What is it like to not have the things that you need each day? whether that be basic needs, whether it be the needs for companionship and love or acceptance, or all of the questions that we have. And I invite us into that way of curiosity, that way, that disposition of inquiry, of getting curious, of, of the magnifying glass focused in on that blade of grass. You'll see that in our brochure as our Lenten image this year. I really think by leaning into these questions, to really focus in on living the questions, 
curating curiosity will lead us into that true fast that God wants for us, not just giving things up, not just adding things, but fasting from the powers and the principalities that, that deceive us, that lead us astray, but brings us back. Because you hear that in that text, if you, if you, then I will. If you do lead yourself into that way of fasting, if you do practice curiosity, I would add, then you will be healed in an instant, the reading from Isaiah says, in an instant, then your light will shine. So maybe the question for me about my great grandfather is not focused on how he died, what his last thoughts were, but how he lived. He had 25 years to walk this earth. He, I am because he was my ancestor in faith, in hope, a carpenter. It reminds me of the carpenter that I celebrate, that we celebrate this time of year as well. So to think about how he lived his life, what choices he made, what ways that he lived, what gave him joy, what he carried with him is a question that I want to hold and lift up because we know that life is not the end. Death is not the end. None of these things are the end in God's love, in God's grace. As we take on these ashes from the palms of last year, as we take these on, we remind ourselves that we are, yes, mortal. The purple reminds us of our mortality. We will not live on this earth forever, but we will forever be in God's embrace. And that's what these ashes are about, to remind ourselves that we are sealed as God's own forever. And life is short. So let's ask the questions of, our, of ourselves. What are we here for? Who are we to serve? What are we to do? How might we help each other in doing those things that we all feel called to? So I love, I love this ritual. It's a mysterious one. It's a little odd. <laughs> Reverend Kate and I were talking about that. We don't quite always know how to do it as congregationalists and as Presbyterians, but this ritual is universal in the Christian tradition, even beyond this this expression of faith. So I'd invite us into this ritual of receiving these ashes in a way that transforms us into thinking about what is God up to and how might I join God in that work? I want to close by adding this poem from Mary Oliver. You may know it. And I think it helps us enter into this way of curiosity this year. It's called When Death Comes. Mary Oliver. <clears throat> When death comes like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering, what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore, I look upon everything as a siblinghood, and I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy, and as singular, and each name as a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does, towards silence. And each body a line of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's all over, I want to say, all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Thank you, Mary Oliver. And friends, I invite you with these words now that many in the Christian tradition lift on this day, Ash Wednesday, hear these words of invitation to a holy Lent. We invite you, therefore, in the name of Christ, to observe a holy Lent 
by self-examination and penitence, by prayer and fasting, by works of love, and by reading and meditating on the word of God. Let us bow before God, our creator, redeemer, and liberator, and confess our sins that hold us back. <laughs>